I'm going to get started here. Let me begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for this day. I thank you for this class and just ask you to just bless our work, help us to glorify what we do, and just to come to a good understanding of the material we're covering today. Lord, in my prayer, Lord Jesus. Amen. All right, so <clears throat> let me get straight into it. Let me just talk a little bit about analytic continuation. We've already kind of talked about this but um, I just want to just try not to talk too long about it, but just enough um, <laughs> to do it injustice. And so <clears throat> the idea of analytic continuation is mm -hmm. basically you've got, you know, you're given some, given some function, right? And so you've got some, um, you got some point, let's say Z naught. Right, and you've got some some disk of on, on which the um, <clears throat> the power series centered at z naught exists. So maybe we could say, you know, f sub zero of z is like the sum n equals zero to infinity of a sub n z minus z naught to the n. So this is this is one way we could start. We could suppose that we have a power series. The, uh, defining a uh, holomorphic function at some point, right? And then what you can try to do is to define a new function, right? By like shifting the center to the power series, right? Like you could maybe go over here to say Z1, right? And then perhaps on there, you'll, you'll find that you can, you can write a power series there let's say f1 of z equals to, you know, the sum n equals zero to infinity of like, um, let's say b, b sub n times z minus z1 to the n, right? And, and I'm supposing it has, so let me say d0 is the disk of convergence for the original one and then d1, you know, is the disk of convergence for my next function, right? Um, then we would say that F1 is an analytic continuation of F0 if, um, you know, if F1, if F0 of Z is equal to F1 of Z, right, for all Z in the intersection of, let's say, D0 and D1, then F1 is a quote unquote direct analytic continuation of F0, okay? Um, does that make sense so, so far? I mean, it's a definition, okay? Now, um, the interesting thing is there are holomorphic functions, right, um, which are defined by some given power series where this is just not possible. <laughs> like you can't, you can't extend past where you already are. Um, like you can't, I would say it's, a, it's, a, it's an analytic continuation. I, I, I would kind of like, I would kind of like to assume for the sake of our discussion right now that, you know, D1 is, is not a subset, right, of D0. Otherwise, it's not so much a continuation as it is just a recentering of what we already have. All right, like, for example, um, oh, let's see here. Um, I guess it's example one. I could look at, for example, the sum of Z to the N n equals zero to infinity, right? I could like let that be my f zero. Okay. And then I could look at um, f one of z equal to, um, you know, like the sum n equals zero to infinity of like, I wonder if this makes sense. Let me try something. This may be totally bogus, guys, but let me try it out. Um, z minus a half plus one half to the n. 
Yeah, see, that's going to be kind of that's going to be kind of shady. Um, let's do it. Let's do it the easier way instead. This, of course, is equal to what one over one minus z, right? Which I can rewrite as one over one minus z minus a half, and then I can do what um, I added a half, so I have to subtract a half to be fair. And then, if you let me finish this here, what's um, one minus a half is a half, and um, so multiplying by two, I've got two over one minus um, two times z minus a half, I believe. So you guys, check me on that for a second. Is that equal to that, or did I make a stupid mistake? As opposed to the smart mistakes, you know. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. This, of course, is straight up equal to the sum, n equals 0 to infinity, of, um, well, 2 to the n plus 1 times z minus 1 half to the n by the geometric series, right? What are the terms and conditions here, though? Uh, I, you know, it's an interesting question to me is, can you derive, is this actually equal to that? Like working this to here directly through like binomial expansions, order by order, adding things, collecting things. That's kind of a formidable calculation to me on the, on the surface of things. Um, that'd be a fun calculation to try when I didn't actually have interesting things to say. But I do have other actually interesting things to say today, so let me not do that. So um, listen, this step right here, of course, is what? This we need the modulus of z to be less than 1, right? Of course, this step right here, we need what? We need the modulus of twice times z minus 1 half to be less than 1. In other words, we need the modulus of z minus 1 half to be less than 1 half. Yep. Yeah, this is the take home part. It's not the direction that it's the take home problem, but in a different way, maybe. Um, so, 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 we have, if I draw a picture of what's going on in this current example, right, we have got the singularity at one, right, and the, ini the initial d naught, this is my d naught, right? And I recentered the series where? I recentered the series from 0 to 1 half, right? And by doing that, I have a smaller radius of convergence, but I'm still running up against that same singularity, aren't I? So for this given function, if I try to analytically continue this series, what am I going to run up against as I do that? The singularity at 1. The singularity at 1, right. Now, there's an example in your homework. Um, rats. Oh, well. I, 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 it may be in the Fisher problems. I, I can't remember. The Fisher problems are nice, but they also don't tell me what they are. They just says Fisher page blah, blah, you know? Um, but anyway, there are, oh, there it is, problem 137. Show that the unit circle is a natural boundary. So one of your homework problems is to show that if you, so this is homework for you guys, but if you look at the series sum j equals 0 to infinity of like z to the 2j, this one um, has quote unquote natural boundary. natural boundary of the unit circle. So I, I think you could argue the natural boundary <laughs> of, of, of this example one is just like you said, it's just, it's just one. That's the only thing we're running up against, right? And if we try to analytically continue any which way that goes away from the number one, we're going to keep seeing the radius of convergence expanding, 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 always going back to one, which is the problem spot, right? But this is really easy to think about because there's this nice 
algebraic formula that we can hang our hat on for all complex numbers except for one, right? Really, in some sense, the real example here is f of z is 1 over 1 minus z. We're just looking at different expansions of it, right? But the, the idea of analytic continuation doesn't have, there doesn't have to be some universal formula like that. Here, here's a really weird example from Saf and Snyder's book. I mean, it's weird, it's so simple that it's weird, but here it is. Check this out. If we look at f of z equal to the integral over c of um, dw over um, w minus z, what's that equal to? There's two reasonable cases, and there's a third case that we have never defined and we probably never will. Okay, except in a limiting sense next week. But <clears throat> so if z is an element of the curve, and so here I'm talking about a closed, co a closed, closed contour, right? Like, so this is, you know, this is c, right? Oh, yes, yeah, either 0 or 2 pi i. Or two pi I. So this if, if what? If, if z is outside, C, right? And this is if what? If Z is inside C, right? That's a, that's a pretty interesting formula, really. And of course, we're, we are silent. F is not defined on the curve. Okay, pick a curve, any curve you like. Any, pick any loop you like, you can define this function, right? So think, consider this. <laughs> If I pick any z naught in here, right, and I and I and I form a power series for that, what's what's it going to be? Like, where is it going to? What, what's the power series going to be if I center, if I expand this at z naught? Like, what is um, f naught of z equal to? You know, some n equals zero to infinity. Of a sub n z minus z naught to the n. What, what is it at this point inside c? What's that have to be? It's equal to what? Two pi, 2 pi i. <laughs> and how do you uh, how do you continue that? <laughs> well, actually, this is kind of perverse, isn't it? Because, <laughs> because oh man, yeah. There's something really, really, really perverse, isn't there? Oh man, because that. It seems like that's, well, that's an entire function. So how, doesn't, how can you not analytically continue that? I don't understand what Saf was saying here entirely. There's something philosophical I'm missing here. I mean, what his comment was is that the curve is the natural boundary for this function if you just look at, like, inside the, inside the curve. You can't continue past that curve. I don't... I think that's true, though. At least if I look at it from that perspective, then, um, I mean, duh. Like, that's the power series. It's entire. I don't get this example. Uh, of course, um, well, we can say this much. Well, that is the power series, right? And what's its radius of convergence? Infinity, right? Where, where does it agree with the given function? Well, only inside the curve, right? So it, cer it certainly stops being a represent, like the representation of this function as that power series ceases as soon as we're outside the curve, right? Um, and if we were to find the power series of that function outside the, at any point centered outside the curve, directly from the function, we get the zero series. And that, of course, would not agree with the 2 pi i series. So there's something, there's something, if you really understand this example, there's something to gain from it, but I'm not sure I entirely do. Let me go on. I was trying not to talk too long about this. So I have some, I have some homework problem, like problem 136 asks you to consider analytic continuations of some functions around a curve. So let me 
try to, so this is a direct analytic continuation. The idea of an indirect one is something like this. So maybe, maybe your, your function, you've got some like singularity here, right? And maybe you start here, right? So what usually the story looks like in, in, in you know, more interesting examples is that you, maybe you have to kind of, you know, um, do it a few times. So each, each one of these is a direct analytic continuation from the last, okay? Like the, um, the power series on the center of all these disks, they um, agree on their overlap, okay? Does that, that make sense? What I'm saying? So if I, if I begin with, you know, F0 of Z, which is a power series with disk D0, and then I directly analytic can continue it to this F1 of Z, you know, which would be something like the sum, you know, Bn, Z minus Z1 to the N, right? And then I keep continuing do, 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 over to here, then this would be an analytic continuation. Analytic continuation of, um, you know, of F naught. So for the examples, for the homework problem 136, you can think about it in terms of things that you already know, like um, some of them are like, there are a couple of examples that are like multiply, like one of these multiply valued functions. So we can choose different branches for different parts. <laughs> so basically the, the game to play is to use the branch to go as far as you can and then to pick the next one to like pick up the next piece and you just kind of keep going. Um, and of course, if you're, the thing is the uh, monodromy theorem, which I'm probably mispronouncing, but oh well. basically says that if you, um, you know, if you start at one point Z naught, right? And you go over here to, you know, Z, um, yeah, whatever, let me call it Z1, all right? Along this, and you analytically continue that way. And on the other hand, if you analytically continue that way, right? And suppose that it's, you know, we're doing, I'm analytically continuing a function from here over to here, all right, along two different, two different paths. And let me draw the circles in just to emphasize the idea. And there's a definition in my notes which is a much more greedy concept. It, it, it has something about like a continuous choice of coefficients all along the path. Um, but in practice, like that's, man, I've never seen that actually. Uh, I've never seen that actually put into practice. Uh, when I get the projector out, I'll show you what I'm talking about. But um, for me, the only thing I've ever seen done for here, and maybe it's just a product of my limited experience, is you know we we think about two different you know series of disks that analytically continue this way, analytically continue that way. The monodromy theorem says that that the analytic continuation that you find at Z1, all right. It's, so suppose that, you know, we've got F1 of Z over here and we're starting with F0 of Z over there and we analytically continue to F1. It says that F1 of Z, if I go from the green or if I go from the red, it's the same, it's going to be the same analytic continuation provided something is true. Provided that, um, oh man, rats. All of a sudden, my mind has drawn a blank. It's not good. Ah. This is at the very tail end of chapter uh, eight, right? So, see, I guess I need the. I guess that's why the definition is what it is. So here's the definition given in my notes for analytic continuation is that you have F 
sub t of z equal to the sum n equals zero to infinity of a n of t times z minus gamma of t to the n, like that. And that's true for z minus gamma of t um, less than r of t. So here, that would be an analytic continuation along gamma. So, <clears throat> so let me kind of try to explain what, what this is saying. So like here is maybe gamma one, here's gamma two, the, the purple paths. And what it's saying is that as you go, I guess in, you could think of it this way. I'm just drawing representative disks as you go. For, so for each time from the starting point to the ending point, there's a, a, a disk of convergence and a choice of coefficients that you have like a disk of convergence for the recentered thing. Um, uh, ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. And then of course these have to agree on their overlaps, right? They have to agree on the overlaps, that's part of it. Um, but the monodromy theorem says that F, F0 would equal to F1 provided that um, every, um, every, um, every path between gamma 2 and gamma 1, like in the middle, let me make it jot dotted like this path in here, let's say gamma S, every possible like deformation between gamma 1 and gamma 2 also allows an analytic continuation along those points. So it's, in practice what it's really saying is like the analytic continuations are going to agree if when you sweep out the area between the two paths it doesn't capture any singularity. Now that, that begs the question, well wait a minute, how do you know there's a singularity? Because you're creating a new function by this continuation process, right? So if my given example has some kind of more a priori larger picture like this one, I know what I'm up against, right? I know that I'm up against one for this example. Or if I'm, you know, doing something like with a logarithm, then I'm going to be up against zero. Zero is going to be my singularity. I'm going to kind of have to avoid that. Um, and pretty much all of the, your favorite functions that are built with a log also are like avoiding zero in the argument, right? But, but anyway, it's, um, that, that's all I have to say about this. It, it's, uh, uh, I, I wish I had, I wish I had an example where this was actually being put into practice. I don't, this is like a definition without an example in my notes and I, I don't like that. Because all my examples are much simpler than this. I, I, I suppose, I suppose I probably could hack the calculation of like recentering along a line segment within the unit disk for that example if I wanted to actually come up with coefficients as a function of time. Hey, that'd make a pretty good homework problem, wouldn't it? Um, since Anthony suggested it. So, um, <laughs> I mean, you probably could, you probably could. And it might confuse the look suggestive. So you, you probably could, you know, starting at the origin, take like a ray out from the origin and find the coefficients you needed as a function of time going from the origin for my example one. You know, like my a sub n of a half would be apparently two to the n plus one, for instance, and the radius of a half, r of a half, is apparently a half. You know, I think we could do that calculation. I really should add that to the notes just to bring this to life, but oh well, okay, I've talked entirely too much about this already. Let us go on. <laughs> Riemann sphere. Let's talk about the Riemann sphere. So the Riemann sphere is a, um, let me just try to quickly define it. So this is like problems um, 132 to 135 are all in the Riemann sphere. So, and, and I'm, I'm using um, Bach and Newman's complex analysis. There's about, I don't know, there's got to be at least three popular ways to set up this thing. And I like, I like this one. I don't know if I like this one. It's what I chose. Uh, I usually, in the past, if you look at my old notes, I've used the Riemann sphere, which is set up a little bit different. Um, but this one is defined as such. So we've got x squared 
So I'm using big X, big Y, and big Z as to not confuse them with little, um, little X and little Y, okay? Um, and even little z, because we use those for the real and imaginary parts of a complex number and a complex number. But these I actually want to think about as, well, this is a sphere, right? And um, let, me, let me hazard a picture of this, if I can. So you guys tell me, this is a sphere in, in like X, Y, Z space. Where, where's the center of the sphere? Zero, zero, one half. Zero, zero, one half, right? And the top of the sphere is where? Uh, nope. Sorry. Zero, zero, uh, one. yeah, zero, zero, one. Now the bottom of the sphere is what? The origin, yeah. And the center of the sphere, like you just said, is, uh, you know, zero, zero, one half. Now the radius of the sphere is one half as well, right? So um, here, let me make a stupid picture. We can think of this big X, right, big Y, big Z, those are, you know, three dimensions. Um, this, so this, we can think of a three-dimensional th three space. This is a sphere of, of, of radius one-half and three-dimensional space. It's sitting on the origin, right? And what we can do, and what we will do, in this way of thinking is identify um, z equal to x plus i y, okay? We're going to identify that with uh, x comma y comma zero. So in other words, we think of the x y plane as the complex number system. All right? That's that's the idea here. We can identify the xy plane with complex numbers, big xy plane. All right, that's one thing. Now, <clears throat> let me draw this picture a little bit more two-dimensionally <clears throat> to try to communicate the idea, because I won't be able to hack it. I won't be able to hack the, uh, the map in, in 3D. There's no way. It's not happening for me today. So here, I tried. This is the uh, the xy plane. xy plane, right? Also, we're identifying it as the complex numbers. Okay? The origin is the point at which they touch, which I've drawn as this dot here. Up here is 0, 0, 1, which you might call n for north pole. It's the North Pole, basically, right? The South Pole's at the origin, <clears throat> like that. So there's a mapping from this sphere called the Riemann sphere and the XY plane that's called the stereographic projection. So what is the stereographic projection? Well, take a point like this one, for instance, um, big X, big Y, big Z, all right, an element of the Riemann sphere, all right. Now, there is one thing I need to assume, that's uh, that, that, that element is um, not the North Pole, okay, not the North Pole. And then we simply take the line that connects the North Pole and that point, that determines a line, right? You geometry people, it's true, right? Two points determine a line. You got that much at least, right? We can at least do that much by now. That was th that was like day one. No, yeah. No, it was like probably third week. <laughs> you know those axioms. Those axioms don't even really make sense if you really drill down into them anyway. But for all of its uh, for, for all of its pride and history, 
it's full of logical inconsistencies. Um, at least I think, if I remember right. <laughs> That's not entirely true, but there, there are really, there are really fussy things in terms of, the thing that frustrates me about it is like, there, there's no uniform standard of proof in these, these classical geometric arguments. Like there is this, like there tends to be this just very, very rigorous insistence on direct use of axioms right up until a point. And then all of a sudden there's just, just like intuitive leap in a place. This probably doesn't happen with Dr. Sprano's class, but if you read like the arguments of Euclid, you'll see this. I, I was reading um, a book by Saul Stahl. When we're using Yeah, so, Hilbert. Yeah, um, there are many. Re, re, there, there are many. Uh, well, Hilbert's axioms are um, cumbersome and technical. There are better ones than that. You're using Hilbert's. Hilbert's with another guy. Kind of A refinement of Hilbert's, right? Because Hilbert's were needlessly technical, if I remember right. But um, anyway, and this is all stall. He has a book called. Um, it's on hyperbolic geometry, mostly, but it has a really, really nice review of like Euclidean geometry and the evolution of the ideas and shortcomings of different things. And he has some criticism of like arguments that you find in Euclid's elements in terms of <laughs> just, <laughs> I can't remember exactly, but there, there is, <laughs> it's not entirely logic. There, there, is intuit there is intuitive leaps in there. It's just gonna happen with geometry especially. But these two points do determine a line and they then unnecessarily fix a unique point on the xy plane, right? That's just intuitively clear. <laughs> and um, so can you guys tell me what would the relation then between this point right here, we're going to call little x, little y, zero. So the notation that I propose in your homework problem for like 132 and so forth, and there's a preamble, um, a scary block of text in mission seven that you, you'll find when you look at it. Um, I define psi being the stereographic projection. I say psi of x, y, z. You like psi, that's like me when I look at the homework. Let's see here. <laughs> Sorry, I'm an idiot. Psi of X, Y, Z is... Gundam style. Ah, Gundam style. Whoa. Whoa. Whoa, that's a nice formula. Um, but that's it. That, I mean, that's... <laughs> okay, great, I defined it with a picture. What's the formula, though? So can you tell me what is little x and little y in terms of big X, Y, and Z? That's a good idea. Let's parameterize that line. How would you do it? Something about a t and a. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's let's make this t equals to let's make this t equal to zero. Let's make this t equals to one. Oh, maybe make this t equals to one, right? That'd be easier. So t equals to zero, t equal to one. I've got my parameterization would be like gamma of t is what? Um, zero, zero, one plus t times what? Uh, this minus that. So you got big X, big Y. What is going on over there? Z minus one. Sounds like a bunch of hooligans. Is there? The, the football game's not till later, right? <laughs> it's not. It's not right now, is it? I don't think so. Okay, I mean. Uh, Us mathematicians, yeah, we can't. <laughs> okay, so that, that's just a parameterization of the line segment from the North Pole to the point of intersection with the Riemann sphere, right? I want to find this point of intersection. How do I do that? What, what T is that at? Goodness gracious. So we've got T big X, T big Y, um, one plus t 
times big Z minus 1, right? This point of intersection down here is going to be from what? Sorry, this board's getting kind of getting kind of busy. Um, well, that's going to be when big Z is equal to 0, right? So big Z equals to 0, we can figure out on our parameterized line here by putting 1 plus T times big Z minus 1 equals to 0, right? And that gives us what? That gives us T equal to what? Um, 1 over 1 minus Z. And so then this point, which is the point I'm interested in, would be gamma of that time. And out pops what? Out pops um, big X over 1 minus Z, big Y over 1 minus Z, and, well, 0. So there you go. That's the formula for X. That's the formula for little y. All right. So there it is. There's the the actual formula for this is is literally just um, you know big X over one minus z, big y over one minus z, and zero. That's the the stereographic projection. Now this assumes what. Z is what? Not equal to what? Big Z not equal to? 1, right? Big Z not equal to 1 was an assumption because we assumed it was not the North Pole. Okay? What do you think we're going to make? What, would, what should we make psi of the North Pole equal to? Well, zero is already taken by the South Pole. Zero maps to zero. Uh, like the, the, the going from here to here, that map maps to itself. It's the, inter the what's the intersection of the line connecting the North Pole to the South Pole in the complex plane? Well, it's the South Pole. <laughs> zero maps to zero under this map. If you put big X and big Y equals to zero, and Z is not equal to one, you just map to zero, zero, zero. So that's out. Can't do that. We want a function. Can't be double valued. Well, we want a one-to-one -one function too. And so the answer might surprise you. The answer is, and it's unfortunate that a certain Jeff is not here because the answer is infinity. You were going to say infinity. Well, sorry. <laughs> so basically what's going on here, I don't want to talk about this the whole class, so let me just kind of encapsulate what we're learning here, is that psi is a mapping from the Poincaré sphere, the, uh, the Riemann sphere rather, to what's called C, uh, man, I can't remember the stupid notation for it, I think it was C hat, C hat I think is what I did, and that's C unioned with the point at infinity. This is the stereographic projection. It is, of course, one of, uh, you know, a lot of the um, progress and in initial study of geometry and, well, topology, I guess, was in map making, right? The, the trouble of trying to make a map which is faithful to the, <laughs> the, the, you know, overlay of the Earth is troublesome, right? Because the Earth, of course, is a oblate spheroid, which, or practically a sphere, right? And you can't make a nice map from the, uh, uh, you know, from a sphere to a plane in such a way that you preserve distances. However, you can make a mapping from a sphere to a plane which preserves angles. This mapping, while not being an isometry, it doesn't preserve distances unless you modify the definition. You could modify the definition of distance on the plane to make this map into an isometry, I believe. It is conformal, though, in the sense that you can prove this. If I have two curves up on here, like this one, right, and that one, and they meet 
like this. I should really use different colors. Two curves up on the Riemann sphere, right? The red curve and the, um, and the green curve like that. And if you study where they map to down here, all right? Wherever they map to, down here, whatever the, their images are under the stereographic projection, well then the angle between their tangents, it's the same. So this theta and that theta, they're equal. It is in fact a conformal map. So that's kind of neat. All right. So that, that's stereographic projection. Now this gives us a model, a way of thinking, if you will, about what does it mean to have a complex plane with an infinity uh, you know, stuck onto it. We can think of that in terms of the Riemann sphere. Um, for instance, one of, your, one of the homework problems is to show that if you look at a, like an open neighborhood of the uh, North Pole, like this up here maybe, like think about this like cap of the North Pole, that would be a, a neighborhood, like a topological, like an open set around the, the North Pole like that. What does that map to? That's, that's right, that would be a neighborhood of infinity on the Riemann sphere. What does that map to under the stereographic projection? Large numbers, Large numbers right. It, it maps to something like this. Oh, the complex plane. The complex plane, it maps to oh. an exterior, what I call an exterior annulus. Uh, yeah. Modulus of Z greater than R. So there's a there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between neighborhoods of the uh, infinity on the Riemann sphere, and being outside some circle in the complex plane. So we can think about think about it in those terms, and we can study. Um, there's more that we can do, and that's what the homework problems explore. Okay, it turns out that this stereographic projection is very helpful for understanding um, something called a fractional fraction linear map which we will then call, we'll later call the Mobius transformations and it's kind of one of the last, our last hurrahs in here. We're, we're a little ways away from it, but I'm laying some of the groundwork. And also we need to talk about the point at infinity a little bit more. So that's what I'm doing at the moment. So the <laughs> point at infinity in the complex plane, how did we understand it before? What did I say it was? What did we do? What did we say? A function is analytic at infinity of what? Right, so we said f, if f, f is, um, let me write it down. You got me? So just, just a reminder, um, f is analytic at infinity, if and only if g of z equals to f of 1 over z is analytic at z equals to 0. So if you start thinking about that, right, what would it mean? So like this being analytic, what's that say? If g of z is analytic, that means, um, you know, g of z is something like the sum, right, um, a sub n, z to the n, right? But then, you know, suppose that this converges for modulus of z less than r, right? What happens when you track back to f of 1 over z if you plug the same into the given power series which exists, what do you get? One over z, right? To the n. When is that going to converge? That's going to converge by the same logic for one over z less than r, which is another way of saying modulus of z um, is greater than what? 
1 over r, I think, right? Is that right? Did I do that wrong? I might have done that wrong. Yeah. And what is that? That's an exterior amulus, right? That corresponds to a neighborhood of infinity by the, under the stereographic projection. And so that's part of the reason that we're looking at defining um, behavior at infinity by um, you know, a property of the function composed of the reciprocal map is that there's this interplay. Okay, so I need to show you guys I can, I really wish I hadn't left my phone up in the office. I'm really bummed about this. But, um, so I need to show you guys some things here. The, so we're in, we're in chapter nine now, and, um, I need to talk to you guys about the Laurent expansion. All right. So, uh, it's a kind of funny thing, but um, you know, if you were to ask me, what are significant, um, what are significant things that have been done in mathematics by engineers, I'd be like, um, I don't know. But this is an exception. Come on. Um, I guess I need to plug it in. Laurent was actually an, a French engineer. And he is probably the one who really understood the importance of what we now call his series. Now, admittedly, I, I think it's in the water. Like, Gauss had to know about it. Cauchy had to know about it. Like, all these guys had to be bump up against this concept. But ultimately, it was Laurent who really had the, you know, like really nice, uh, elegant understanding of it, which was ultimately accepted by mathematicians who first brushed him off, apparently. So, <laughs> like in the first mention of it, Cauchy in 1843 says, this extension given by M. Laurent seems worthy of note. Anyway, so it's kind of fun. Um, it was, he was actually, he died fairly early and this stuff was published by his widow after he, after he died, some years after he died too, like 20 years or something. Um, and so here's the Laurent decomposition. Um, if I can get it. What the Laurent decomposition is about, let me try to explain where we're going. We've had the concept of a function being holomorphic or analytic on a, um, on a region. I need to draw some pictures before, we, before I get into this. We need some pictures to, to understand this better. So I think one of the things that maybe you could easily have missed in the uh, lead up to this, you could easily have missed this, is the idea that holomorphic doesn't mean that there's a power series that converges on the whole of the domain. Holomorphic is a local concept. Analytic is a local concept in the sense that, you know, if this is the domain D, right? And if F is an element of the holomorphic functions on D, what that means is that if I pick any point in here, right? Boop. Like that one. Well, there exists some disk D naught, right? A subset of D on which a power series exists and represents the function faithfully at that point, right? But that one power series doesn't have to hold for the whole domain, right? F being holomorphic on the whole domain D doesn't mean I have one power series for everything. I ha probably need a different one over here, right? Although don't ask me for the function with this domain, I have no idea. Oh, I guess I could just do that stupid example from earlier. Say it's the integral over the curve, which is the boundary of this stupid shape. So the function's 2 pi i inside, and it's... <laughs> that stupid example, like, you could... Man, anyway. 
All right, so this was the context of holomorphic. What we're about to get into, Laurent decomposition, it's all about annulus. It's all about annuli. So for the, for the Laurent series and the Laurent decomposition, so first of all, the Laurent decomposition will beget, it will bequeath to us, if you will, <laughs> the, uh, um, the uh, what's the word here? Um, do, 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 do. All right, so uh, here I'm centered at z naught. So z naught's in the center, and then do, 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 All right. We are assuming for the Laurent decomposition that the function is holomorphic between the circles. It's, on, it's holomorphic on an annulus. So we have F holomorphic for r uh, rho less than or equal to, well, less than, let's say less than modulus of, uh, do I say less than or equal to? No, less than. Uh, less than z minus z naught, less than sigma. All right? F holomorphic for that. All right? That is the context here for the Laurent decomposition. So let's understand that to start with, okay? Now, come on, man, what did I, I have spent, I think I've spent more time cleaning the board today <laughs> than on analytic continuation, honestly. The viewers don't know that. Oh, the viewers don't know that, that's true. Well, that's, they, they missed out. <laughs> There we go. I feel better. That's kind of weird. Anyway, um, all right. So what does the Laurent decomposition say? Let's, let's get to it. Oops. Here it is. The Laurent decomposition. And, uh, oh, man, look at that. Do you see what I have? Well, I'll just comment on the picture in just a second here, but um, the um, notice I have zero less than or equal to rho, less than or equal to infinity. What, what is that allowing? You, could, you might call them like degenerate annuli, you know, like a disk is a degenerate annula, annuli. So like the inside goes to zero. That's one possibility. The other possibility is the outside is infinity. So it just doesn't have, it just goes on, right? Both of those are possible. If it's the case that F is analytic um, in this context, right? Which is the interior of the annulus, okay? Then F of Z can be decomposed as the sum of F0 of Z and F1 of Z. And here's the deal. F0 of Z is um, analytic um, inside, the outer inside the outer radius, right? Inside the sigma radius. And F1 is analytic outside the inner radius. Do you get that? F so like, to draw it here, so like, let me just draw a picture. So like, in here, to here to here, F0 is analytic. All right? But then, <clears throat> so inside the outer radius, it's analytic. And then outside, oh man, I need a different color. Outside the inner radius,
I'll get it eventually. And then outside the inner radius, like on 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 F1 analytic. You get that? So uh the decomposition exists well beyond where we're supposing F is holomorphic, okay? Both inside and outside. But not at the same time, right? One is for inside, one is for outside. See that? But <clears throat> if you add them together, they give you F in the annulus, all right? And we're also going to ins insist that we normalize the de decomposition so that F1 is equal to zero at infinity in order to get a uniqueness. All right. So um, the theorem is that such a decomposition exists. Now, once you know this decomposition exists, all you have to do is hit the decomposition with the integral theorem, Cauchy's integral theorem, and basically take, this, take the annulus and apply Cauchy's integral theorem. You get the integral in the, in the inside is equal to the integral on the outside through like the deformation theorem, and that will produce a formula. Um, we, we will derive the Laurent series from the Laurent decomposition with Cauchy's integral theorem. It's like not that hard. I don't know if I'll get to it today, but we'll get to it. So <clears throat> here's an example of a Laurent decomposition. If I have this function, z cubed plus z plus 1 over z, um, that simplifies to z squared plus 1 plus 1 over z for z not equal to 0. So in this example, um, we can identify rho equals to 0 and sigma equals to infinity. And my f0 is z squared plus 1. That's analytic, um, right? Um, everywhere, actually. And this f1 um, is analytic all the way out to infinity because this is analytic at infinity because if you reciprocate this, you just get z, which is analytic at infinity. Um, as a general rule of order, if your function just has a sum of reciprocal functions, it will be analytic at infinity. Whereas if you have a sum of infinitely many reciprocal powers, that will not be analytic at infinity. Um, no, that's, I'm sorry. I didn't say that quite right. It's not the reciprocal powers that get you at infinity, it's the regular powers that get you at infinity. Like sine, for example, is not analytic at infinity because sine of 1 over z is not analytic at 0. Anyway. Um, so if we have an entire function, exponential sine, sinh, cosh, cosh, cos, in this case we can identify that f of z is equal to f0 and the f1 is just 0. And so it's, it is its own Laurent decomposition on the complex plane. So yay, it's kind of stupid, but there it is. In other words, um, this, 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 will, this recaptures holomorphic, right, on disks as a special case, or on the whole complex plane as a special case. Here's the proof. All right, so, <clears throat> Oh, I guess I had one more example. If you have f is analytic at infinity, then that means there exists some exterior domain for which f of z is analytic. In that case, you make the f0 zero, 0 and you make the f of z equal to f of 1 on that exterior annulus, and that's your Laurent decomposition. <laughs> All right, so here's the proof. It's really, really, um, it's really quite, quite pretty, and it's not that complicated, honestly. And the proof is basically just this. It has two stages. Stage one is to prove that if there is a Laurent decomposition, it's unique. All right, this proof rests on Liouville's theorem. So here's how it goes. If you have two different Laurent decompositions, F0 plus F1 and G0 plus G1, right? And that's the case um, where, of course, um, you know, we're talking about inside and outside a certain radius as, as I just set up. Then if you look at, um, they're both equal to f of z, right? So you've got g0 plus g1 is equal to f0 plus f1, but that gives you that g0 minus f0 is equal to g1 minus f1. Ah, interesting. However, if we define a 